Welcome back to Economic Outlook. Today I want to discuss a topic which has received increasing coverage in the financial media, the dollar-denominated carry trade. The strategy is invoked in a number of contexts. Depending on the situation, the dollar-denominated carry trade is believed to be a sign of how far the value of the dollar has fallen relative to other currencies, an inherent problem associated with increasing current account deficits in the U.S., a signal that the United States financial power is beginning to decline, a sign that equities may be overvalued, and even a signal for other countries to look for a reserve currency besides the dollar. All of these ideas have merit. Some of them are accurate and applicable today. Others are more speculative about the future of the dollar and its role in international finance. To understand these distinctions, it's important to know what a carry trade is, how it's constructed, and why dollar denomination is such an unusual and important signal to global markets. Before exploring the implications of dollar denomination, it's important to understand what a carry trade is. Carry trades are derived from the concept of carrying cost. Simply put, carrying cost is the amount of money required to hold something in inventory, be it a physical commodity like oil or a currency like the yen or the dollar. In the case of oil, a physical commodity, Carrying cost is the amount of money required by an investor to hold a commodity in storage in a tanker or some facility until it's ready to be refined or used. For a currency like the yen or the dollar, carrying cost is the interest paid on a loan in order to secure the currency. Currencies can have different carrying costs. In practice, this means that one currency can be borrowed at a lower interest rate than another. Carry trades try to exploit these differences in interest rates to create profits for investors. In a typical currency carry trade, a firm will borrow one currency at a low interest rate. It will then convert this currency into a more high yielding currency at the market exchange rate. The new currency is then invested in an interest bearing account. At the end of the investment, the currency and its proceeds are converted back into the original currency. The loan is paid off and the firm makes a profit of the difference between the interest paid on the high yielding currency minus the cost of the loan and the low yielding currency. For a few years, consumers created their own form of carry trade by exploiting 0% introductory rates for credit cards. Consumers would sign up for a new credit card with a 0% introductory rate good for a year. Then, the consumer would take out a cash advance on the card and put the money in a savings account. At the end of the year, when the introductory rate expired, the customer would pay back the credit card and pocket all of the interest payments from the savings account. This became impractical when credit card companies began to charge fees for cash advances, but the concept is remarkably similar to currency carry trades. The following example will explain how a carry trade works and how firms are able to profit from the strategy. The first step in a carry trade is to borrow a currency at a low interest rate. Historically, firms have been able to borrow the Japanese yen at low interest rates, making it an attractive vehicle for constructing carry trades. This chart shows the Japanese interbank lending rate and the United States effective Fed funds rate. Both rates represent the cost for banks to make overnight loans to meet reserve requirements. Each also forms the basis for prime rates and general lending rates in their respective economies. Since 1971, the Fed funds rate has usually been higher than the Japanese interbank lending rate. This signals that it's cheaper to borrow the Japanese yen than the Japanese dollar. This makes the yen an appropriate currency to borrow for a carry trade. The next step in a carry trade is to convert the original currency into a new currency which can be invested at a higher rate for a specific term. The chart we just saw showed that interest rates in the United States were typically higher than in Japan. This means that dollar denominated investments will probably yield higher returns. The firm will convert the borrowed yen into dollars at the spot exchange rate. It will then invest dollars for a specific term. This chart shows interest rates in Japan remain below those in the United States for most of 2002 and 2003. In the hypothetical carry trade I will describe, I'll use actual spot exchange rates from these two years. 
The third step in a carry trade is to convert the new currency back into the original and repay the loan. In this case, the firm will convert US dollars back to Japanese yen and repay the original loan. Assuming foreign exchange rates remain constant, the profit the firm makes will equal the difference between the interest rate paid on the US dollar denominated investment and the cost to finance the loan in Japanese yen. I'll discuss more about the implications for foreign exchange movement in a little while. This example shows a complete carry trade with actual figures from 2002 and 2003. In this example, a firm borrows 10 million yen and converts it to dollars and invests the dollars at a 4% annual return. At the end of the trade in July 2003, the dollar denominated investment is converted back to yen at the market exchange rate. The firm makes a profit of almost 300,000 yen. The carry trade helped the firm borrow at a low rate and invest the proceeds at a higher rate. Had the firm only invested in yen, it would have made 50,000 yen. Similarly, if the firm had simply borrowed dollars, it would have made less money because its interest rate on the loan would have been much closer to the money market rate of 4%. Remember, the rate on Japanese yen was 0.5%. Because the firm borrows money it does not previously have, it creates profits synthetically. In my next entry, I will examine some of these features of a carry trade in more detail. I will look at their implications for global financial markets. Additionally, I'll examine the issue of dollar denomination and why this is so unusual. Thank you as always for joining me here at Economic Outlook, and I'll see you next time with the conclusion of the carry trade series. As always, be sure to check out my website at www.econoutlook.com.